Hello there, Atheist Jr. here, your friend and humble narrator, and I'm really excited to be doing my debate review for the rematch between Ian Chen, who has been so supportive of my channel and is somebody who I who I am proud to call my friend, and Ken Hovind. But it's exciting because you never know what to expect when Ian debates Ken Hovind. Um, because he likes to say outrageous shit <laughs> during the debates. But I'm happy to say that I got my uh, OBS sorted out. So now I can highlight comments like this. This one. Oh, yeah. And unlike Kent Hoven, I am happy to accept your super chat. So feel free to send them. Anyway, let's get started. Buddy to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and we are here for the much-anticipated sequel between Ian Chen and Kent Hoven. What are we debating tonight? We are debating the topic of evolution. Evolution is on trial. Jump before we get into this epic showdown on evolution. Ian, Ian Chen, been a little while since you've been here. So it's been one year. to have you back. Yeah, it's great to have you back. How you been? A little bit about yourself. All right, I've got uh, I've got uh, a a slide up. If you can, just one slide. If you can put that up, Donny. You guys can see that. All good. Yes. Yes. I'm going to take about five minutes anyway. Most of you probably kind of know who I am. The last time I debated uh, Kent was about a year ago, so it's been quite a while. Um, so I just want to start by kind of saying, um, introducing myself a little bit. So my name is Ian Chen, and that's not my wife. These are pictures of my wife. A little nod to Ken and his, and his joke there. Uh, firstly, I do want to thank Grayson from Base Theory Channel for swapping his debate date with me. Hey, shout out to Grayson. Go, go subscribe to Base Theory if you haven't already. You can kind of consider this debate as the entree and Grayson's upcoming debate with Ken as the main course in the dinner and the dessert, I should say. And Grayson, I'm going to do my best to try and soften Kent up for you so you can finish him off later in your debate and take You're going to soften rock hard Kent? Good luck with that. Get help. Um, I do also want to thank Kent for his time today. I know it's been a difficult week for him with his best friend being arrested for six counts of kitty feeling. So I oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I do appreciate that uh, he's taking the time. Ian, to Ian to okay, I'm going to stop you there. Wait, I'm gonna stop you there. Already, yeah, we've, gone too, <laughs> already <laughs> we've gone too far. So, Ian, you got Grow one up. jab in there. You got one jab in there. From now on, we're keeping it strictly to the debate. Sure, topic. sure. Um, yeah, Over okay. Real quick, Ian, and before you continue, Kent, is there yep, anything yeah, well, you'd like to say in response? Yes, that's an ad hominem. He's not my best friend. It has nothing to do with the topic tonight. So grow up, Ian. You're a doctor. Come on, act like one. Let's talk about the topic of evolution. What do you have for evolution, sir? Go okay, ahead. okay, okay. Th thank you for that. So, um, okay, so the, the other thing I do want to talk about is that my the opinions that you hear today is that of my own and not the views of my employer. I also want to note, and I do thank uh, Kent for um, uh, recognizing this, is I do actually have a PhD in biblical studies from Rockville University that I purchased for $875. Oh, so he is a doctor. So we have a super chat from Sebastian. Um, it says, I am most definitely a Kent phobe. God, I got issues. So if Kent calls me doctor, I will certainly return the favor for him. Um, I do also want to state that I will I will actually accept uh, Kent's definition or six levels of evolution. Whilst it's not the actual definition of what a scientific evolution theory is, I will accept Kent's six layers or six tiers or six definitions of evolution for the purpose of this debate today. Also, I want to say that I won't accept any assertions or statements that are not supported by scientific papers, and I especially won't accept biblical passages as evidence. Also, Kent likes to make, um, you know, use quotes and point to the Bible as evidence. To me, that is totally meaningless. For example, whether a global flood existed or there was Adam and Eve as the first humans is a claim from the Bible. It is it is not evidence of the flood, nor is there nor is it evidence that there were two originating humans. The Bible is the source of the claim. It is not evidence of the claim, and it is literally just words on paper. There is a couple other things I kind of want to quickly address because I know Kent will bring it up. The first one is Kent will no doubt ask sometime in this debate whether I 
and relate it to a lion or a tiger or grizzly bear or even the great American bald eagle. I want Kent to kind of show me, if he asks this question, any book or any paper that says a rock gave birth to a human, whereas the Bible literally states that Adam was created from dust, and what is dust but really, 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 really small rocks. So I will admit that I share a common ancestor with a lion or a tiger if Rocky Kent admits that he is related to mud or even corpolite. So I just want to get that one out the way. The last thing I just want to kind of ask Ken is he has actually stated many times in the past that he believes that because of the fall of man, mankind has become weaker and our genome has been degrading over time and eventually humanity will head, will head to extinction. Well, I do want to kind of point to Ken, point out to Kent that blonde hair and blue eyes is caused by a genetic mutation. That means melanocyte cells can't produce as much melanin. And this changes the color of hair from dark to blonde, or in the case of eyes, from brown to blue. So my question to Rocky Ken is, will he admit that I, Ian Chen, am genetically more superior than he is, as it is clear that he has lost more information in his genome than I have? So <laughs> over to you, Ken. Okay, we'll consider that, Ian, a five-minute introduction before we get into the main points of discussion for the debate kent will give you equal time five minutes for an introduction go ahead well thank you sir i think he's shown clear evidence he's already lost he's nothing but ad hominem so far can't attack the, the subject yes you do believe you came from a rock the textbooks clearly teach there was a big bang for 13.772 billion years ago where a dot of near nothing or nothing exploded it swelled out into the universe and parts of it cooled down and, and made the earth a hard rocky crust. It was a, First it was a molten mass, then it hardened into a rocky crust, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. Yes, Ian, you do believe you came from a rock, and all the textbooks show that. I've got hundreds of them here. That's not the topic of the debate tonight. Then why did you bring any of it up? You are supposed to offer evidence for evolution. Where is it? Where is the evidence of any animal or plant ever producing offspring other than what any four-year-old would consider the same kind? A dogs produce a variety of dogs, cows produce a variety of cows, but they're still the same kind of animal. But you guys have t lines on textbooks connecting all of them back to a common ancestor. That's not science. You put these family trees in here and say the human and the bird are related, going back to a common ancestor with the reptiles and the ladybugs. Ian, are you related to a ladybug? Long ago and far away, of course. Of course you believe you are, because you believe in the dumb religion of evolution. And I'm here to help you tonight. I want to get you uh, past that, where you can learn the next level. Like, wow, there's a God. He created it. So my name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science in biology and, and earth science and physical science and algebra, geometry, and trig for 15 years. I've been a Baptist preacher for 48 years. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. The only way this could happen is God had to make it. Somebody outside of time, space, matter created time, space, matter. Somebody created life. Life is too complicated to have happened by chance. That's an argument from incredulity. And if your God exists outside of our reality, then he does not exist within reality. Therefore, he does not exist. Coming from a rock 4.6 uh, 4. billion years ago or 3.8 billion years ago. It's just a fair, evolution is a fairy tale. It's an absolute idiot, uh, idiotic idea that we all are related to a ladybug and a pine tree. This is not science, oh, and a worm, I'm sorry. This is not science. My contention is the evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Never been a dumber idea. There's no scientific evidence for it at all. We have a science center and a museum and a theme park here in Lenox, Alabama. Come on down and see it, it's free. We'd love to have you. If, if he thinks evolution is the dumbest idea in the world, then by definition, he would have to think that flat earth is not as dumb. Thank you, sir. Okay, Kent, thank you for that intro. Ian and Kent, we got the introductions out of the way. To the audience, please tag me with your questions. We will, as always, be having an audience Q&A where we uh, get you. Donnie, I will tag you with a yellow snowball. You guys involved and i appreciate how engaged the audience always is okay so we're just going to get right into basically the discussion where we're going to go one point at a time one topic at a time ian has slides prepared for this and so ian let's hand it back to you for argument number one go ahead yeah i've, I've got a i've got several can you guys hear me yeah i'm off mute i've got several arguments but i think before i do that i just want the audience to appreciate how different 
my worldview is and Kent's worldview. So um, I'm going to, Kent, um, I'm going to ask you three questions. These are yes or no answers, but feel free to elaborate because I, as I said, I just want the audience to understand that you have a position that is here and it is totally different from my position. And I Okay, from Big Bad Mama for $5, we have a super chat. It says, AJ, can I please get a Hovren? Ho Hovren, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't insult my, my, he's not my best friend, okay? And, and, and he, he didn't get charged for six counts. He only got charged with one count this time of fiddling kids. Uh, Hovren, fiddler, diddler. I want the audience to kind of see that our views are totally opposite. So my first question really to you, Ken, is this. Do you believe, question one, do you believe the universe was created by an intelligent being as opposed to creating its creating itself by natural mechanisms. Over to you, Ken. Absolutely, yes. Not possible any other way. I love this strategy. I, I did a similar thing in my debate with Kent, so I think this is a really excellent idea. Yep, and like I said, just wanted to understand your views, your worldview versus mine. Question two, do you believe the Earth is around about 6,000 years old or that it is much older, such as approximately four and a half billion years old, which is obviously what I believe? That's not a yes or no question, but I believe the Earth is about 6,000 years old. Yes. Yes. Great. And the last question, do you believe that animals were created according to their kinds rather than evolving from a common ancestor, which is obviously what I believe? I absolutely believe they were created and they always have brought forth after their kind. No exceptions. Great. Thank you very much for, for that, uh, Ken. So everyone in the audience, as you can see, both Ken and myself have two very different and divergent worldviews. So my best evidence of evolution is, is very simple and is one that I will explore later in this debate, is that I will demonstrate to you today that Rocky Kent has no scientific evidence for creation. And as you have heard from his worldview and what he just articulated, by default, that means evolution is true. So if I prove creation is not scientifically possible, by default, evolution is true. And that's that will be what I'll be exploring later in this debate. Ken, over to you if you have any comments on that. You have got to be crazy. You think because you can prove that uh, the Earth is more than 6,000 years old, by default, evolution is true? There's, still, there's a thousand other options in that. I mean, no, that doesn't prove evolution is true. That's not what he said, though, of course. Ken has to immediately misrepresent what he said. So will, you admit, so will you admit that if you can show that evolution is not true, then you will admit that creation is not necessarily true? The, that the there are other of, options. The purpose of the debate is for you to show evidence for evolution. I have always Correct. said, I have always said the creation worldview is a religion, and you will never admit that you have a religion. Evolution is a religion, isn't it, Ian? I will admit that evolution is a religion if I can get you to agree to sign a petition that will remove 501c benefits from religious institutions or that you <laughs> that you sign a petition that allows evolution belief to also get 501c benefits or being or being tax free. So we've got to put it in the in in, in basically the, the the similar kind of comparison. If you think evolution is religion, then it has to get the same benefits as other religious institutions. Can I get you to agree on that? And then it's no longer tax supported, so you will no longer teach it in public schools and public universities. That would be wonderful. Yes, evolution should be removed from all public funded museums, universities, schools, should not be taught. We should teach and science in science class, not evolution. That's not what he said at all. Kent, I mean, I think you're not paying attention here, Kent, but this is a really interesting strategy. So um, clearly, what he's doing here is is showing uh, you take Kent's argument similar to what Tom Jump did. You take Kent's argument and you you just sort of change the variables in it and show that he wouldn't accept you putting that argument out, even though Kent has obviously made arguments that add up to saying, well, if I can disprove evolution, then that proves creationism is true. He's even said that if if you can have in court, if you have one piece of evidence that proves somebody is not guilty, that means that, you know, that they're not guilty. Or if you can prove that the earth isn't billions of years old, that means it's somehow 6,000 years old. So this is an interesting strategy. And, and we should not teach uh, religion as well. Like I said, it's got to be a level playing field now. If you think that evolution is a religion, then whatever rules that you impose on evolution you must accept that for religion as well so okay let's not teach evolution but let's not teach any religion as well i mean that's that's a level playing field right that's what you're saying 
have it the same. Well, the bigger question is, should we even have public schools? But if we're going to have them, we should not give exclusive coverage to your religion and expose ex exclude all others. Right now, and evolution is the only, only religion taught in schools is evolution. Okay, so look, I, I think we've hit a bit of an impasse here. All I'm saying, Ken, is that if you saying if you say evolution is the same as religion, then everything must be the same. We don't teach evolution in public schools. We don't have churches. It's the same. You want you want a tax exemption for for religious for your religious beliefs. We have tax exemption for people who believe in in evolution <clears> as well. That's all I'm saying. It should be the same. So if you want it, if you want to call oh, well. evolution religion, then give us the same benefits you have as well, or remove your benefits. Well, the, religion, the tax exemption doesn't go to the person who believes in religion. It goes to an institution. If you want to start a private school and teach evolution to kids who want to pay and come learn it, go for it. Then it ought to Again, they already do that. There are colleges that teach evolution where people willingly go and sign up. Like Dr. Dan teaches evolutionary biology at Rutgers, and people willingly go and sign up to learn about evolution at those colleges. And I'm sure that there are private colleges as well. So these already exist. Be tax exempt. You are right. But it should not be in public schools. We're diverting a long ways away from the purpose of the debate tonight, Ian, I think purposely, because you don't have any evidence for evolution, do you? Go ahead, present so, some. So, so my, my point here is, will you admit that if you, if you can prove that evolution is not correct, that by, that, that by default, creation is not, just the, it's not the only answer? So even if evolution is not true, you can't prove creation. Will you admit that? Well, they're, they're right. There could be several other options. Maybe people on Mars made it. You know, th th yep. so yeah, yeah. There could be other options. It's not. There's more okay. than just two here. Okay. As as long as you admit that in this debate, if you can prove evolution is not true, that does not mean that your position is correct. In fact, your position could be just as wrong. Correct. But your your job is to okay. prove evolution is true. That that's the purpose of the debate tonight. So get started, would you please? Where's the evidence okay. for evolution? Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. And look, um. Look, I, we, we live in kind of these kind of times where, you know, um, we have to be kind of inclusive, etc. Now, I know you have said that you have, you, if you identify yourself as a doctor, we'll call you doctor, and that's fine. Okay, I, I, I that's fine. You, you, you can do that as well. Um, I want people to know, I want everyone in the audience to know, because we live in these times that I identify myself as a male, and my pronouns are he and him. So just just to clarify, what do you identify yourself um, a male, female? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to jump in because we've got a we got an excellent audience, a lot of people today. But we've also got limited time, so we've got a few jokes in, we got a few jabs in, great. But now you you're on mute, Ian. Now let's move only to the topic. Anytime I hear a jab or an unnecessary joke, even when it comes to Kent's name, call him Kent, not Rocky Kent. Let's have a professional debate. This is a formal debate. And so let's now move. We're 15 minutes into the debate. Let's now move strictly into the the evidence. Stop. Okay, well, I hope that this is applied evenly. We'll see if Kent throws out any insults across the board. Starting now, go ahead, Ian. Okay, I'm sorry I heard you. It's too bad because I know what Ian was planning on saying there, and I think it would have been pretty funny your feelings uh kent I can, i'm happy to call you ken if that's what you want please don't cry all <laughs> right so um before i kind of go to evidence i do want to clarify some claims that kent has made in the past and the first one i want to talk about is distant starlight problem so we know the speed of light we know how long it takes light to travel in one year if we see a star that is one light year away we know it is six trillion light years away the distant starlight problem is where if we see stars that are over 6,000 or so light years away, then logic tells us that the universe is at least over 6,000 years old. We have stars and galaxies that are over 6,000 light years away. In fact, the furthest galaxy is 13 and a half billion light years away, meaning the universe has got to be at least 13 and a half billion years old. So Rocky Kent does not accept much of the way that science has calculated the distance of stars, but he has said in previous debates that I have heard that he accepts the stellar parallax methodology. And Rocky Kent is correct. Using telescopes, we can only, we can only measure stellar parallax up to 150 light years away. But Kent does not accept the other methodologies where we can we know that a universe is 13 and a half billion light years away. Obviously, then logic dictating is 13 and a half billion years or at least years old. So um so look, I, I am not like Kent. I haven't taught high school maths and science for 15 years. And <laughs> I love I love the uh, the subtle uh, jabs at Kent. So good. Kent has. So I would like Kent to kind of explain to the audience how he uses the trigonomic function to calculate stellar parallax. So over to you, Kent. 
Well, trigonometry is very simple. Sine, cosine, tangent. There's three, th three angles and three sides. I can give you a trigonometry lesson if you'd like, but you are correct. We cannot measure star distances using parallax trigonometry beyond. That's not what he said. And your explanation of trigonometry did not explain anything. A certain amount because the base of the triangle becomes so small. I'll show you a picture here. I cover this in thor thoroughly on my video number seven, Creation Seminar Part 7, where we talk about the stars and the distance to the stars. We, can, we do not know the distance to the stars. Uh, they may be billions of light years away, but you're stuck with the false assumption that a light year is a time. A light year is a distance. It's like saying a hoven minute. How far can hoven run in a minute? Stars, the Bible says God stretched out the heavens, but viewing a star, let's see, when you look at a star from two different observation points, you can calculate using basic trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent. I can teach you that if you'd like. So the distance can be calculated if you know the distance between your two observation points. Okay, Kent, it's really distracting when you flip through your slides like that. But in the future, if, for anybody debating Kent, if he does this, that's a good sign. <laughs> it's like a sign that you're you're winning. Okay, we have a, a super chat for $10 from Devona. Uprock? Uprock? Colin Kent, a doctor, devalues the meaning of doctor. Love your work, Atheist Jr. Well, thank you. What a nice compliment. What a generous super chat. Thank you, Devona. I appreciate that. In this case, with your eyeballs, you see two, two observation points a uh, few inches apart, and you can calculate roughly in your brain distances to things, okay? Um, Earth's diameter is about 8,000 miles, a little less than that, but <clears throat> 93 million miles is the distance to the sun, so the, or, the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun would be, uh, they call that one astronomical unit, or eight minutes to, for light to get here, so the diameter would be 16 light minutes. Here we have two observation points in January and in June, both looking at a star, trying to calculate the distance to it. Using parallax trigonometry, if it was one light year away, that would put a real tiny angle. Orb Earth's orbit around the sun is 16 light minutes across. A year has over half a million minutes in it. So if you want to measure 16 as your base and half million as your third point, you got a real skinny triangle. I can do the math on that if you'd like. But eight, it's about eight and a third miles, okay? Uh, can you, I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago since we're not only going around the sun, the sun is traveling through the universe also. So be there are instruments, satellites, instruments that geologists use where, yes, they can tell exactly where we were six months ago. We don't have to do it using our own brains. We can use <laughs> electronic instruments to measure this. It becomes a very complicated uh, mathematical problem. But one light year triangle has an angle of 0 0.017 degrees. If that like Kent, why do you think that we can predict eclipses many years in advance? It's because we can already predict what the orbits of planets are going to be well in advance. So if we know where we're going to be six months in the future, then it's very easy. It's even easier to tell where Earth was six months ago. Okay, we have a super chat from Stupid Whore Energy. I love that username. For 199, it says Kent doesn't appear to be aware of fractions. <laughs> uh, half a hoven. The little yellow dot was Earth's orbit, not the Earth, the orbit of the Earth. It'd make a real skinny triangle. To measure the distance to a star 100 light years away, you're saying you can measure an angle of 0 0.00017 degrees. That'd be like keeping surveyors 16 inches apart and moving the third point 830 miles away. Get two surveyors with transits trying to calculate the distance to a dot 830 miles away. Kent, this example doesn't work as an analogy because the Earth is curved. That would obviously be well under the horizon of the Earth. So, of course, you couldn't measure that far. They're 16 inches apart. They don't know what the dot's 830. They're supposed to tell me it's 830. Can they measure that? I don't think so. Two surveyors in Pensacola, 16 inches apart, trying to measure the distance to Chicago with using parallax trigonometry. To go 15 billion is clearly impossible. Yeah, the difference is, is that we don't have a curvature cutting off our viewpoint in space. You can just see out into space. So it's not a good analogy. They might be 15 billion. I'll give it to you. They're 15, they're 200 trillion light years away. That doesn't prove the age of the universe. I don't know how you can get stuck on this. It's a distance. They could have been created that distance two seconds ago, okay? Parallax can measure less than 100 light years. This is what the normal textbooks will say. No, they could not have been created two seconds ago because 
we know how long the light has taken to reach us. And you can't move faster than the speed of light, obviously. So you're just wrong on that one. Using parallax trigonometry, we're very limited to less than 100 light years. Just Google it, okay? So how do they measure the star distance? They use uh, a red shift as the third thing. It's a stretch that's about the closest star. I cover all this in video seven, Ian, if you'd like to watch that. But uh, I think the Bible says 17 times God stretched out the heavens, and that may be causing the red shift. So yes, I'll stand by my guns. I don't think it's possible to measure much more than 100 light years using parallax trigonometry, and even that becomes real difficult. Well, we can use standard candles, so that's irrelevant. So if you want a yeah. different method, so don't claim you can measure it with direct observation. You cannot. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I as I kind of said, I agree with you. Um, it's about 150 light years from what, what um, from the, research, the papers that I've seen. Okay, I'm glad you actually can, you have explained how the formula was calculated. I was, I'm actually surprised. I thought you wouldn't know. Uh, but as you've kind of explained, this is the diagram um, and how we apply the formula, the formula. It's a tangent kind of function on trigonometry. I won't go into that because Kent has explained that. But I do kind of want to point out that Kent, uh, that basically Kent agrees that stellar parallax is probably the most accurate, accurate way because it's based on actual ob observations. Everything else, whether it's, you know, a red, red shift, um, supernova explosions, where we know the actual energy of the explosions that we can measure, how, how, how much the energy has kind of dissipated as we kind of see on Earth to, to kind of calculate the distance. I'm just assuming, Ken, that that's too many assumptions for you and you don't, you don't understand or you, you don't accept that. So we'll stick. Okay, for Devona, we have another super chat for ten dollars. Uh, I don't think so. Is the best argument Kent can come up with? So, in 1989, the satellite Hipparchos was launched. That's the year I was born. Measure stellar distances using stellar parallax, using laser tele tele telescopy um, outside of Earth, and it could measure distances of up to 1,600 light years away. In 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was updated with an update in 2009 could extend that measurement using stellar parallax to 10,000 light years away. And in 2013, the European Space Agency Gaia Space Observatory satellite measured star distances up to 30,000 light years. So this is methodology that Kent has said is relevant and appropriate, so stellar parallax, but we're using telescopes that are in space and not on the ground. Using telescopes that are on the ground, we can at most measure cell using stellar parallax 100, 150 light years away. I gotta change some settings on my webcam. It keeps getting blurry, so I'm gonna turn it off for a second and just let the audio play. Using satellites up in space, this goes to 30,000 light years away, which is already five times as old as what Ken thinks the universe is anyway. So over to you, Ken, to, make, to have any comments there on, on this. Well, all of your arguments so far is to try to rescue the main ingredient you guys need for your religion, which is time. You're trying desperately to show, show that somehow we have more time. There's your pacifier. We've got plenty of time for evolution to take place. You still haven't presented any evidence for evolution. You're trying to say you think the Earth is more than 6,000 years old, which has nothing to do with the argument. If it's trillions of years old, we never see an animal produce anything other than its kind. So you're not on target here tonight. The speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. Do you believe at the Big Bang that the, the actually not only the light, but the matter accelerated way faster than the speed of light, which is what the Big Bang teaches? The speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of 100. So your whole argument tonight so far on the distance to these stars is, you said it's 30,000 light years away. That's a distance. That's not a time, Ian. It's a distance. If it is 30,000 light years away, but light was going faster at the beginning, it doesn't, then the, you're basing it today's speed of light, trying to calculate something and prove the Bible wrong. You're way off target, Ian. Get back on target. Where is the evidence for evolution? Scientists have admitted for a long time that the speed of light may have changed. We don't know what the speed, the speed of light is constant. Even if you are measuring those distances accurately, 30,000 seems like a stretch, but okay, you're still assuming the speed of light's always been the same. Nothing's reliable, not even the speed of light. That was known 20 years ago. Time varying speed of light causes the, solves the cosmological problems. The decaying speed of light. Uh, there's lots of articles on this. It's been known for 20 years that the speed of light is not a, a reasonable, uh, it's a rubber ruler, okay? But even if the stars are 30,000 light years away and, they're, and, they're, and then you think that proves 30,000 years old, which it does not, but even if it did, that's not evidence for evolution. This article, why no one has measured the speed of light. Speed of light is not about light. Uh, cosmic uncertainty. Is the speed of light really constant? 
I mean, read up on it. There's plenty of information out there. So the answer is yes. The speed of light is constant. You might change the front velocity, but you're not going to change the actual speed of light. And it wasn't saying it was faster at the at the beginning of the creation is assuming that the universe was created. So you don't get you don't get away with that on my watch, Ken. You're you're not you're not giving any evidence at all. You're still trying to prove there's billions of years are available. I'll give you billions of years. Now show me an animal producing anything other than its kind. That's the de debate tonight. Yeah, why does Kent get to do the pacifier thing? Is that not insulting someone? No, I, just, I just, no, 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 no. So let me just clarify one thing. And Kent, I would agree with you, but if I did, then both of us would be wrong. Um, <laughs> so look, my, I said at the very beginning that I accept your six definitions of evolution. Are you now telling me that in fact, your definition of evolution is only biological evolution? Because what I'm talking about- This is a good point. Because I was waiting for Kent to say this when, and this is an interesting strategy from Ian, because he starts off arguing about uh, this, you know, the distance to stars. And I was waiting for Kent to say, oh, you're supposed to give evidence for evolution. But according to Kent, that is part of the evolution theory. And I have a question I've been wanting to ask Kent. So he says that evolution theory is incomplete if you don't say where the animals came from and where the matter came from, the stars and the planets. So my question to Kent would be, do you know what the definition of atomic theory is? Because basically atomic theory just says that um, all matter is made out of tiny particles called atoms. But atomic theory doesn't tell you where the atoms came from. It doesn't tell you where the protons and neutrons came from. So is atomic theory incomplete? Because if it is, then we better take away some Nobel Prizes from some people. Why is it just evolution theory that he says has to go all the way back? We know the reason. It's because in his goal to conflate evolutionary theory with his own worldview, he has to make it start from the beginning of the universe, even though it obviously doesn't. For the purpose of this debate tonight, I would, if you want to do the whole thing, I think if I said I reserve the right to go back and say, hold it, you're not telling us where life came from, and you're not, okay? I'll get the six different definitions of the word evolution up here. You're, you're trying to, uh, let's see, debates right here. Okay. Just tell me what your definition of evolution is. That, that's okay. I mean, I, I've always heard you talk about... That was, that was a ridiculous non-answer, Kent. That was just a bunch of word salad. About the six levels, and at the beginning I said, I accept that. I'll take your definition and I'll argue from that basis. So are you changing your definition now? No, no, no. I, I will still maintain there are six different levels or meanings or stages to the word evolution. Yep. So I and am arguing evolution as per what you are saying then. If you, you want to start with biological evolution, I'm agreeing with okay. you. Yeah. If you want to start with a living object, I will point out, Your Honor, that's three, four stages into this. But OK, start with a living object. Show me how any amoeba or a single cell creature has ever changed into anything else. But I think I reserve the right to say, we have to go back and say, you don't know how, where time came from. You don't know where matter came from. You don't know where space came from. You don't this is brilliant. I love how Kent is trying to have it both ways here. He wants to not admit the fact that he got called out for trying to say that, you know, talking about the distance of stars isn't evidence for evolution. But he's like, oh, well, I reserve the right to still no matter what you say, go back and say, well, you're not explaining where the matter came from because that's that's basically just his get out of jail free card where no matter what argument the person makes, no matter how good the evidence is for how an animal evolved, he's going to say, oh, but you didn't tell us where the animal came from, which is completely ignoring the evidence and ignoring the argument. It's just a straw man. It's a, it's a moving of the goalposts. You don't know where energy came from. You don't know how life got started from non-living material. You'd like to skip all that. I know you would, and I know why, because there's no scientific evidence for that. I'm not skipping it. I'm actually talking about cosmology right now. My ex my example on distant starlight has nothing to do with your levels five or six. It's really at the beginning where we're talking about cosmology now. I have, I have said at the beginning, I accept your definition of evolution, and I will be arguing on that basis. And now you're trying to tell me that you mean biological evolution. Which is it, Ken? Just tell me, and I can argue accordingly. Tonight, I'd like you to show evidence for biological evolution. Great. But I'm so not saying I'm not I'm not saying that's all there is to evolution. Tonight, I'd like you to show me evidence for biological evolution. 
Woo! 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 I want to see the evidence. Woo! 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 Whoop de woo! Quit stalling! Okay, Come great. on! No, I'm not stalling at all. And secondly, you are absolutely wrong when you when you say that light can be sped up. Those papers, when I know you're looking at um, articles, I haven't got it up. If you want to pull it up, um, there are two different measurements on the speed of light. There's the frequency. If you consider light as a wave, what you are showing is the frequency of the different photons moving up and down the wave, but the actual limit of the speed of the wave is constant. And that's when people talk about the speed of light, they're talking about that wave that's traveling through a medium. They're not talking about the frequencies going up and down the actual wave itself, which has been shown to be slowed down, what, 370 or 470 times. That's probably the, what you're referencing, but you're confusing it with the two different measurements of the types of light. And there is no evidence that light has been 10 billion times faster in the, in the past. So clearly, if that's what you think, you can show me a paper. As I said, I'm not taking hearsay. I'm not taking biblical passages. If you make a statement that light is 10 billion times faster at the start, show me something that kind of shows that. Yeah, this is what I was trying to say earlier, but I couldn't think of the term. So Kent mixes up phase velocity and group velocity. Group can't change. Phase has been shown to change hundreds of times. So if you ever see Kent citing an article talking about the speed of light changing, he's talking about the phase velocity. He's not talking about the actual speed that light travels through a vacuum. Or it'll be an example where it's not light traveling through the vacuum of space. It's through some other medium that can change its speed. And this is another thing I've noticed is that, and this was happening during the Praise I Am stream, is that Donnie will put Kent on full screen, like, but he doesn't seem to do this to the other side. Maybe it's just me, but I've noticed this. Otherwise, it's me. You are okay. still, you're still stuck on time. I'll give you billions of years. Show me evidence for evolution. Okay. You're not the authority to give out billions of years, Kent, you don't get to decide what arguments other people get to make. Don't be so arrogant. Okay, I'll take it. So I'll, I'll talk about genetic limits here. So in, in the past, you have said numerous times that you believe that there are variations. And in this case, you're talking about what is it? Um, your number six tier evolution or microevolution or whatever you kind of call it. But you have said that there are limits that stops a kind from changing into another kind. And that's fine. So, um, and, 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 I, and I'm not talking about limits where it's, it's limited by physics. So you cannot have a pig that's as big as Texas. Uh, the bones and the structure of the material in the bones cannot support that weight. You can't, you can't even feed a pig that big. You cannot have a cow jump higher than over the moon. Obviously, it cannot propel its force stronger, so it overcomes gravity, et cetera. So I know you're laughing, but and, and I know you kind of use it as a bit of rhetoric. Those are silly limits. What I, what I want you to focus on is genetic limits. So I know in the past that you do not believe that a primitive tree-dwelling primate evolved into Homo sapiens. You have said that. You have also stated that you don't believe that a fish fin can evolve into walking limbs as what evolution kind of states has happened. And you don't believe that a chimpanzee grasping foot has evolved into a human foot. Like okay, My advice for this, this section would just be um, focus on one at a time here. Um, because Kent is going to call you out on that. And it is it is better with debating Kent to try and f focus what you're talking about onto one thing. So I would just say to either give this first example or the second one and then go from there, but not to present both of them up front. Such, you believe that there are limits. So my question to you is quite simple. Um, here is the... Uh, genome for chimpanzee chromosome. Can you please point out which chromosome? Don't even. I don't even need to know the detail. Just which chromosome does the genetic limit sit here that will stop a a chimpanzee grasping foot to evolve into human foot? You have said there are limits. So show me where these limits are. That's a, that's the chromosome on a chimpanzee. Over to you. Well, science. The word science means knowledge. What do we know by experimentation, testing, and a demonstration? We know chimpanzees only make baby chimpanzees. I don't need to show the limit where it is on the chromosome. The observation from all of human history says chimpanzees only make baby chimpanzees. This is silly. Pardon, Ken, when you have, when you say there are limits, show me the limits. Like, don't just you're making an assertion without without any sort of evidence at all. This is really good. So, uh, Ken totally dodged the question. 
you just ask it again, just restate it, because that makes him look bad because he he is obviously dodging the question. This is what I tried to do the last time I engaged with Kent on the praise stream. So always do this. It's one of the easiest ways to score points on Kent during a debate because he's always going to dodge questions. He will never answer a direct question ever. So when you say there are limits and forget the rubbish physics limits that you keep on talking about, where is the genetic limits that, that proves that something can't turn into something else? Because you are the one that said it, not me. You're the one that state there are limits. So show me the limits. I don't know that there's a genetic limit. I know that all observation is cows make baby cows. And You've said that there's a limit that might, that might be in the genes, Ken. Haven't you said that before? So if you don't know what it is, it's like Mark Reed said, if you don't know what the limit is, then why are you saying that there's a limit? Horses make baby horses and humans make baby humans. You're the one who wants to, you're the one who believes you're related to a strawberry and a, and a that is unrelated, Kent. That's not related to what he's talking about. That's changing the topic. Ladybug, is there a limit? What? You're related to mud, as I said before. I'll accept that I'm related to whatever if you if you accept that you're related to mud because you are created from dust. I, I will accept the idea that my whole body is made out of minerals which came from the ground. So is yours. Made out of minerals specifically that came from the ground? I don't know about that. Like... I, I came from my own mother and then my cells have divided and made new cells, but I, at no point did I absorb any minerals from the ground. I mean, unless you want to say minerals that were in water that I drank or food that I ate, I guess you could say that. All right. Fair enough. Are you made from anything? Are you made from anything special other than vitamin, minerals that come from the ground? All, all the let's 92 this, elements. Let's move this along. Homeobox genes are genes that we know um, regulate anatomical feature development. So I've given you a clue here. Here are the homeobox genes in the chimpanzee genome. Does that help you kind of point out where these limits are that stops the grasping foot to become a human foot? It's okay if you don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking you. You've said there are limits. Tell me what the limits are. If you don't know, that's fine. I don't think anybody could possibly know where it is in the genome. The genome is so complex, mind-boggling, and it's a code. That genetic code is like trillions of lines of information, much more complicated than any computer. This is really good. This is probably his best argument so far for Ian, I would say. And it somehow makes all the things, including the fingernails and toenails and hair and everything else. So where are the limits? That's a silly question. Where is the evidence, would be my question, of any change? You claim a grasping foot like a chimpanzee became a human foot, which would be a loss of information. It'd be nice to be able to hang your, with your feet. So we lost something there. The chimpanzees have one over on us. But no, that doesn't prove any relationship. Where is the evidence, Ian? You don't, don't know. know. The, that, that, that's that's, that's you my conclusion. You don't know. Nobody, you don't know. You nobody say can show you what you're asking. Nobody can show the limit in the code. Okay. As long that's as the so audience different. understands that you are making a statement that you cannot prove. When you say that there are limits that stop something from changing to another kind, you can't show this. You can't prove it. You're just making an assertion. As long as people in the audience understands that, and it's okay. I might not know, you might not know, but the difference between you and I, Ken, is if I don't know, I say I don't know, I don't make an assertion and pretend to know something. Oh, yes, you do. You believe, you said you earlier related to something other than a human. Where's that? That's a statement. You made a statement. Do you believe you're related to a strawberry or to a ladybug? Ultimately, do you have a common ancestor with a ladybug? Go ahead and make the statement. Yes, I believe I'm related I, to a ladybug. I, I have a common ancestor with a lion. I have a common ancestor with a tiger and a grizzly bear. Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play what? your game and, and choose, choose a living organism, organism that just sounds silly, okay. but to get it, to you your just, point, yes, I do have a common ancestor with a lion or, or a great it, American bald eagle. You just, you just made the statement. Where's the evidence for that? You're making a claim, a religious claim that you're related to, you have a common ancestor with a tiger or a lion. Where's the evidence for this, Ian? You just made the statement. The burden of proof's on you. You claim you're related to a lion, and you want me to pay to teach that to all the kids in schools. Where's the evidence? Kent, you're a 501c3 organization, so you don't pay property taxes at Dinosaur Adventureland. The, your 2018 tax return shows a big goose egg for property taxes. And you don't even have kids in public schools, so this doesn't affect you. But you, you, know, you just made a claim earlier, or you have made a claim, that there are limits and he Ian just showed that you can't provide evidence for that claim. And now you're demanding that Ian provide evidence for his claim. 
So, Kent, I just want to ask you, what question do you think you're answering here? Because all I'm asking you is, you you made a statement that you believe that there are limits. And all I'm asking is, you is show me where these limits are. And you are just digressing to a whole bunch of totally unrelated, irrelevant kind of conversations. So, and I've given you an out. I've kind of said, if you don't think there are limits, just say you don't think there are limits and we can move on. That's all. That's all I'm saying. But you're right. the ones that have claimed many times that there are limits. And I do not accept the limits that you have given that are obviously physics constrained the limits we would have to would any farmer tell you there are limits to how much milk you can get out of a cow yeah correct the physics record. limits the size of the cow the size of the udder how how quickly that cow produces the milk there are actually limits that i can point to so uh, yeah the cow jump over the moon come on ken i've already said okay. that so today the world's record cow gives 138 pounds of milk a day hamsters also have udders i used to raise hamsters and sell them is it possible to get a hamster to give 138 pounds of milk a day? Hamsters don't have udders. They're a mammal, so they have teeth. But an udder is a very specific structure on a cow. Why are you saying that? Have you ever seen a hamster with an udder? Because I haven't. Utter, utterly ridiculous. Oh, and then Ian Chen says, I'm a bit behind, but I learned from AJ how to keep pressing Rocky Ken on the question. So thanks, AJ. Well, that's good. I'm proud of you, Ian. I'll just say cows can do it. Cows can do it, Ian. Can hamsters ever be bred to give 138 pounds of milk a day? No, I, I don't I don't want to make you sound silly here, but is do you think there is a difference between a hamster and a cow? For example, the size? I mean, look, I'm not as smart as you. I'm not a doctor. Well, actually, I am, but I'm not a, I'm not a <laughs> doctor from like like you've got. Um, so I can easily see that the size of the hamster and the size of the cow is very different. When you ask me a question that's obviously based on the size of the animal, that's a pretty stupid question. I just want to kind of point that out, Ken. You're the one who's claiming all animals and all plants have a common ancestor. If the hamster and a cow have a common ancestor, why can't we get a hamster to give 100 pounds of milk a day? Because they don't have udders, Ken, and they don't produce milk that way. They don't produce that much milk. Is there a limit to hamster milk production? Ken, are you are you not understanding what I'm saying? There, I'm I'm pointing out Real to well. you the physics limit. So you are giving me a small animal as an example versus a large animal like a cow as an example, and you're asking me, can that small animal produce the same amount of milk as a large animal can? Can I mean, can you not see that's a stupid question, Ken? Do no, I have to actually I'm, point I'm, this out to you? I'm trying to show how stupid evolution is. These charts we teach the kids in school have everything coming from a protozoa, a single-celled creature. Does a single-celled creature like a protozoa or an amoeba or a bacteria have a limit? You believe it turned into a whale over millions of generations. So apparently there's no limit. If the amoeba can turn to a whale, why can't the amoeba turn to a hamster? And why can't the hamster give more milk to give 100 pounds of milk a day? Why? What a ridiculous line of questioning. Okay, we have another super chat from Sebastian and says, Ian is too smart for this debate. <laughs> well, maybe. Show me the genetic limit in a hamster, why it can't give 100 pounds of milk a day. Where's I'm the just going to go limit? back to the same question I asked you, which you've still not answered, and it's very simple. Like I said, you can just say you don't know. That's okay. There's lots of things I don't know as well. Ken. All right. So all I asked you was, you have said that there are limits that will stop a grass. Just just take a fish. That will, that will stop a fish fin from evolving to a limb. Where's the limit to that? That's all I'm asking. You can, you've just digressed and pushed things on and start talking about this and that and whatever. I've just asked a very simple question. If you don't know, you don't know, that's fine. We can move on, nothing against you. But I just, all my question is, you have said there are limits to move from one kind to another. And I've used a specific example of a change of the kind, such as a limb of a fish or a limb of a chimpanzee or a chimpanzee-like creature. Where's the limit to stop that? That's all my question is. That's all I kind of want you to focus on. The limit is apparently genetic because we never observe any fish limb changing to anything else. Why does that mean that it's genetic? I asked Kent uh, the last time I had a discussion with him, if human beings haven't observed something, does that mean it didn't happen? And he said no, after I asked him about four times. So just because humans haven't observed something, that doesn't mean it did or didn't happen. It's yep. not. And where is it in his genes? Where is it in his genes? I put up the comments here for both of them. It doesn't matter. You're the one claiming it changed. You need to show me how it changed. I don't know where the limit is, which chromosome it's on. It doesn't matter. The fact is, fish make baby fish every time. But what, what
there are lots of lines of evidence to show that animals have changed. You're claiming that they can't change. But you don't, you, you, you seem to not know how, what it is that's stopping that from changing. What I'm no, saying exactly. is there is no genetic limits for the change. So I can't show you a genetic limit for change when I don't believe there is a genetic limit for change. As long as the information is there for it to change, it can change. And by the way, Ken, just, your, just go back to your, your previous point about uh, the grasping foot losing information. That's complete rubbish. A grasping foot loses information because it can't, it can no longer grasp the tree and hang upside down or whatever the chimpanzees do. I agree. But the human foot is built for running. A chimpanzee cannot run as fast or as efficiently as a human. Is that a game? Yeah. So evolution is not strictly about gaining. You have trade-offs where you have adaptations that might help in one environment or for one type of organism. And you have changes where it could potentially have a different function, but that function is now helpful in the new environment. So evolution isn't only about gaining and it, it Ken seems to think that evolution can go backwards. It can't, there's no reverse evolution. Any information then it's lost its ability to hang upside down a tree, but it's now gained the ability to run super fast and, and endurance for endurance for hours. Is that a gain information? So your whole point about losing information and gaining information is a total non sequitur doesn't exist. So look, let's move on. Cause I think you're, um, you can't answer well, the question. I didn't get a chance to answer oh. that. Yeah, go uh, you say the human foot is built for running. You mean like it may be designed for running? Like maybe there's a, are you admitting there's a designer who designed the foot for running? Is that what you're admitting? Yeah. Evolution. Oh, good. Thank you, Evolution sir. You believe in God then. You, you are welcome. God. You, you are. And, and this is my little kind of token nod to, uh, to Donnie here. <laughs> so if you want to pull your SpongeBob, I've got my little Superman doll here for Donnie as well. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Look, um, I, I, I kind of want to move on anyway, because I don't think we're going we're to get anywhere here. I just want the audience to understand it was a simple question. When Every time Kent mentions there are limits, ask him, what are these limits? And Kent basically admits that he doesn't either doesn't know or that there's no limits and pushes the answer back to myself to demonstrate where are the limits that stops the movements. And I'm saying there are no limits. As long as the previous information is there for evolution to act on, it can act on it. For, and what I mean by that is you're never going to see a Pegasus where it's got four limbs and the wings, but you can see birds where you've got the four limbs, but two of the limbs become wings because evolution acts on those two limbs and changes it from, you know, claws to a wing. All right. So as long as the information is there, there is no genetic limit for it to change. Whereas Ken is saying there is, but he's not able to kind of point any out. So I just want to kind of point that out as well. Oh, uh, these boots were made for walking. And these boots were made for hoving. And that's just what they'll do. One of these days he's coming. And I help get over on you. Over. Okay, I'm going to move on as well. Unless, Kent, you want to kind of close. Yeah, on. let me jump in here. So this is basically point two, maybe three, depending on how we count them. I appreciate I've, I've that response. Yeah, I've called it two, but. Okay, two. Awesome. Uh, Kent, if you, if you wanted to respond to that, and then Ian will hand it back to you to move to point three. Well, he's clearly mixing science with imagination. He, he believes there's no limit. You can change a fish fin into a, uh, a, a, a human limb or something like that. That's his, that's his belief. He can believe that if he wants. There's no observation for it. Science is limited to what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. That's the standard definition of science. Look it up in any dictionary. Science, knowledge gained from observation, experiments that describe the world around us. Science is based upon what we can observe right here. Science, I got more. Science means knowledge. What do we observe? We observe fish always make maybe fish. They always have fins. We don't observe them turning into a limb. He says there's no limit. Well, that's his belief. He's mixing his, his religion with science. Science, what we can observe. Evolution is not science. And we have observed it. You can look at the fossils and you can see the different fossils. Uh, where part limbs, finally, part. finally, okay. So you're saying fossils are evidence that the, that the fin turned to a limb. Is that what you're saying? Fossils are evidence that there is a creature out there that has progressively more and more similar features to a limb and less and less similar features to a fish. So, ah, you finally said the key word that I was listening for. Hoven, Hoven, love you long time. Oh, ah, uh, shucky, shucky, five Hoven. We have tetrapods out there where, you know, um, the limbs are longer, but yet it has something similar to ankle bones that allows it to not just push 
on the land, but also the kind of flap in, the kind of push against the water as well. Then progressively, we've got animals or fossil, fossilized remains of, of creatures that have these limbs getting longer and longer and slowly becoming limbs, like, you know, arms and legs, etc. Yes, you've got Titalid up there as well. So we have, if you call that observation, we can observe these fossils and we can see the limbs at different stages of what one would expect from an actual fish fin to the different stages that leads to a human <clears throat> hand or a, or a horse leg or whatever. So I don't, know, I don't know how you can kind of look at these fossils and not put them in a sequence that kind of demonstrates that evolution is the best answer as opposed to you saying God created every single one of that as it looks. Okay. Let's put, use a little logic here. I'll try to help you out here. I agree. I agree. We can, I agree. We can observe fossils. That does not prove that they're intermediate between anything. Is a tricycle intermediate between a bicycle and a car? No. A tricycle is designed evolve? to be a tricycle. Do they evolve? Tricycle. The, we, we see fish that have short limbs and then the fin. That was a dodge right there. I think a better question would be, can they be related to other can the car and the tricycle be related to each other? It does. Maybe they were designed that way, and they've always been that way. All we know is all fish today produce fish with limbs or fish with fins. We don't so, observe. You so can't, are you it, saying it, that every single animal in the fossil that we see that has different stages of similarity and dissimilarity between a limb and a fin, are you saying each of them was created separately? Is that what you're saying? Because I can accept that. If that's what you think, fine. Well, but you're telling you, me that each of them are created separately because they did not evolve. They did not change. So they must have been created separately. That's what you're telling me. You're trying to give the magical ability to fossils that no animal today has. No animal today can produce a lot of, there's a lot of animals in the ocean in, today that have fins. Show me one now, change, what, I wanna see it alive, change into something with a limb to find a- show, show me something that I know you can't show me because it's impossible and doesn't even represent evolution. A fossil, you can't prove that fossil had any children at all. You sure can't prove it had and children you, that live. You have said previously that you granted me billions of years, and now you're taking that back. Of course, evolution doesn't doesn't change from one offspring nope. to the other. The mother doesn't change, doesn't give birth to something that's totally different from what it is. It takes time, and you have previously given me that six billions of years. So I'm not even sure what you're asking here. Oh, here comes the pacifier. Here, here, here comes the hoven. Uh, <clears throat> um, if you ever hear Kent say you, know, you, you can't prove a, a fossil uh, had children, you should have just tell Kent, Kent, you've shown pictures of a fossil giving birth. Even though I don't actually think that that's what's happening, that's what he thinks is happening. Well, okay. Has, if, are there animals today? You want time or more time? Um, nom, nom, nom. Okay. Um, nom, nom, nom. Are there animals nom, 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 nom. today that have fins? Yes or no? Yes. Trillions of them, well, billions swimming around the ocean. A fi a Show me one, change it to a limb. No fossil could count. This is not irrelevant what kind of fossils we find. You might have found Why? something that went extinct. You might have found Why a fish that had a short. Count? Why doesn't a fossil count? I don't understand. If you're seeing evidence of a I, I fin agree. that's half a fin or half a limb, why doesn't it count? I can show you a single-celled algae that becomes multicellular and gains an extracellular matrix. That's a beneficial mutation and a gain of function. It may not be a limb, but it's, you know, evolution doesn't have to be these huge changes because microevolution is still evolution and Kent accepts that. So every animal that gives birth, I know not every organism gives birth, but animals that give birth, the child is always going to be slightly genetically different from its parent. That change counts as evolution right there. I agree. You don't understand. Okay. In any court of law, finding, an, finding a bone in the dirt and claiming it did something that no animal today can do would be laughed out of court. There is no evidence of any animal today with fins slowly growing limbs. Why could this bone in the dirt do it millions of years ago? Why, and how do you know it had any children? How, who did it marry? You have to have two to make this change at the same time. There'd be trillions of changes to go from a fin, which you swim with, to a arm, which you grab and swing from trees with. How is this not called out as a scatter shot, like asking five questions at once that are different topics? It's ridiculous. Yeah, You're so imagining. I, I'm, so I'm glad yeah, you I'm, finally gave evidence. You think fossils are evidence for evolution. You're way off track, but you're welcome well, to believe I'm, that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Kent, you're not letting education get in the way of your ignorance. So look, <laughs> Kent, um, I want to understand.
Got him. Why you don't think fossils is evidence? You keep on telling me fossils don't have children. Well, they have parents. Right? They have parents. So we can see a progression of change as we look through the, parent, the parental lineage, right? So you have said many times that fossils are not evidence, and I've stated that we have found evidence of intermediate transitional fossils that we put in a line between a fish and a tetrapod to you know other other animals with with limbs this is a good point because kent wants to set point to a singular fossil and say oh that's not evidence that's not transitional but we don't say i mean you, there are examples of fossils that you could say are transitional like lucy but what the transition is is showing a lineage of fossils like the the evolution of tiktaalik to other tetrapods from lobe finned fish sarcopterygian all that stuff you don't just show tiktaalik by itself you show the lineage and you can see looking at the the different fish you can see that change it's obvious and the fact that we found them in layers that were dated consecutively that should be evidence to anybody who can understand the common sense of it. And we can see that at each different stages that there are more com comparable to one and less comparable to the preceding one. Now that to me is evidence that things changed over time because we had the fossils and we can date those fossils so that they fit within the evolutionary kind of time frame. You the problem is Kent disputes all of this. He disputes the fact, first of all, that fossils can even be evidence for ridiculous reasons just because you can't prove that that particular fossil had children which is irrelevant he disputes the, the radiometric dating it, you know so he asks for evidence and then he just hand waves all of it away when you present it you have said you don't accept these fossils i want to understand why you do not accept fossils as evidence well i'm glad you finally admitted you said we find these fossils and we put them in a line Yes, evidence by dating methodology, as I said. We, it, everything cross-confirms each other. Don't avoid the question, why don't, it's a very simple question now. Why don't you believe fossils is our evidence? You've said this many times, but yet you try to push the question back on me. Why don't you believe fossils are evidence? All fossils are evidence of, scientific evidence is, something died. That's ridiculous. And I asked Kent this question, and he could, he, he avoided it, of course, but I asked him, if all you can tell from a fossil is that it died, how do you know that it died in Noah's flood specifically? And he wouldn't answer it. You cannot is that all prove. You think? Honestly, Kent, is that all you think? If I well, saw Ian, a let's just allow fish. Kent to finish his thoughts yeah, okay. on that one, and then and okay. then we'll hand it back to you. No worries. Yeah, so yeah. If, yeah you sorry, find, if, if, if you find a fossil in the dirt or the rock, you could probably reasonably conclude it lived and it died. Could you prove that it was uh, intermediate between two things? No. Could you prove it had children that were different than itself or came from parents that were different than itself? All we observe today, and a whole lot of animals are born every day, everything produces what anybody would say is the same kind. There are minor variations, but they all oscillate between two lines. There are limits, like the dog, small dog, big dog. They, they stay within limits. They're still a dog, and their size is limited. They can't get as small as a flea or as big as the moon. Sure, there are limits, physical limits, biological limits. There, so, so for you, you're now claiming that a fossil has the ability to do something that has never been observed. And for you to put them in a line according to how old you think they are is still ridiculous. That's not science. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Kent, you, you, are, you are actually proof that evolution can go in reverse. So look, <laughs> you still haven't answered my actual question about why you think fossils do not provide evidence. I have said that we have found fossils of animals that are closely, that look like a fish but their fins have what look like ankle bones. In other words, if you're, if you're a fish with fins, you don't need ankle bones unless you're actually using that fin to lift yourself out of the water. In other words, the first step to a limb. So there is a fossil there, and you're telling me that all you know about a fossil is that it lived and died. That's all you know. You, you can't tell by looking at the fossil that if it had a fin that it probably lived in an aqueous environment. You can't tell from a fossil from certain characters, like for example, if we found fossilized fed feathers that it could fly. Depending on the environment it's fossilized in, if it's fossilized in kind of mud, that it wasn't, you know, in an, like I said, in a watery environment. Are you telling me that all you know from a fossil is that it died? 
And I'm telling you that just based on many other factors, we know a lot about that fossil. We can tell what the animal looks like by piecing the fossils together. We can tell from his limbs how it lived. Did it live mainly in the water? Did it live on land? We have found fossilized um, you know, um, remains of its food in its stomach. So we know whether it ate vegetables, seeds, nuts, or whether it kind of ate other animals as well. You know, there are lots of things that we can tell a fossil besides that it dies. So I challenge you, Ken, you have said multiple times that you don't believe fossils are evidence, but you've not given me any evidence as to why. And I've given you many examples as to why we know more than just that it died from looking at the fossils. Okay. Okay. If you could show me from the fossil what it ate by finding contents in the stomach, I would agree. Yep. Does, does that prove it changed to something else? Animals no, today but have food in their stomach. Too. Limbs does. Limbs oh, does a, little bit of, a little bit of crosstalk there. Gentlemen, Kent, finish your thoughts and then Ian will throw it right back to yep. you. Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. Stop me when, nope. I, when I interrupt. That's good. I'm saying you finally gave what you think is evidence for these family trees that a protozoa or an amoeba of some kind turned to all these different creatures. This is what the textbooks teach. I'm simply pointing out, if your evidence that a protozoa can turn to biology teacher is a fossil that is partway between some of these, you cannot prove anything. No animal today is doing this. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Farmers for centuries have been observing animals make babies, and they always make the same kind. They count on it. The farmer counts on the cows having a calf. They count on it. That's all they get. They try to make variations, but they get limits. More milk, more beef but they get limits. So you want to believe because you found a fossil that has what you consider look like ankle bones, therefore it's turning into a limb. That's not science, that's a religious belief. We see fish today that have short limbs before the fin grows and they use them just fine. Some use them for walking on land and walking on the mud, but it's not changing to anything else. When they have babies. Well, what about before it could do that, Kent? Did it change to have that ability to walk on land? Or was it created like that? They're the same kind, got the same bones, nothing changes. It's not turning into a limb bone. You believe by imagination, SpongeBob style, that it changed over millions of years. I'm saying these charts are pure propaganda. The limb bones connected to the cat bone, the cat bone connected to the hoven. Uh, no fossil is going to count as evidence for evolution. You believe all the animals and plants have a common ancestor, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? You believe this, don't you? Hoven, hoven, don't you? And the evidence is fossils? Come on. Get come on. Come on. Hoven. I'm going to try that. this one more time, Kent, because I just and then don't you're gonna have... One more time. Quit. Yay. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. Yay. No, I, I, well, no, it's just because you're not answering the question. Um, look, I don't have the patience or the crayons to kind of explain this to you. So I'm just going to try one more. <laughs> Did you say crayons? Okay. Okay. So you said that you don't accept fossils. What I'm saying is we have fossils that show a transitional step from anything. You, you, you can choose whether it's a limb for a fish fin moving to a limb or, you know, dinosaur claws moving to, uh, to, to wings. Choose whatever it is. There are multiple intermediate steps of fossils. From what I'm understanding from you, Ken, is that... One more time, we're going to celebrate. Oh, yeah. All right. Don't stop the whole band. That you're saying that every one more time... Every one of those fossils, given that, you know, that's not variation, that you know, they're different enough that <clears throat> evolu your belief in evolution is that those are not variations. You're telling me that every fossil that we find that may have a slight difference compared to the fossils that we find that preceded it you are telling me that God created that fossil specially. Is I did not say So, I did not Kelly, say is that is that evolved from a fish or is that created specially? I would say many of them may have been created specially. I don't know. That's beyond science. What we observe. Beyond science? Yeah, because science is religiously neutral, Kent. With science. It doesn't study the supernatural. Science is limited. Okay. Science cannot explain a lot of things. It's only what we can observe and study and test. Wrong. I think the existence of billions, maybe even trillions of fossils, if you want to count the microscopic stuff, like found in various layers of uh, Why material around the world. Them? I think the very existence of fossils is evidence of rapid burial. No animals today is turning into a fossil. When oh, I like this argument from Ian. This is really good. They die, they rot. We got a possum on the road up here. He's not going to turn into a fossil. He's going to rot. The very he's, he's dead. I already poked him with a stick. 
Harvin. Uh, existence of fossils is evidence, A, that they lived, A, that, B, that they died. We don't know they had any children, but we know they died under conditions to turn them into a fossil. I think Noah's flood would explain that just fine. There are fossils by the billions around the world. They're not showing any change. You can, you can arrange them in some kind of fictitious order and make it and believe that that's evidence for evolution, but it's not. It's evidence so, that it died. It's evidence so you, screaming at you, Ian, that there was a flood. God's word so is true. Do you true. believe that there are fossils found in, in other types of environments? For example, sand dunes, sand, dry sand environments, volcanic ash. Is there, do you accept that there are other types of fossils that are not fossilized? I hate sand. It's coarse and rough and it gets everywhere. It gets in, the, in between the hovens. From any sort of watery environment at all. You'd have to define the word fossil. There are things that are. You'd have to define the word fossil. <laughs> Screw you, Kent. Mummified. There are things that are petrified. There are things fossil, so they're rock. that are things that are hoven fried. It's deep, deep fried hoven. Rock, rock, bone shaped rock. Right. Mineralized. You... Boner shaped rock. Get a... bone. Right. A fossil, right. General, most fossils are indeed formed in sedimentary rock. Most hovens are formed in hovendary rock. Which is perfect to explain the flood. Petrified clams like this one in the closed position. Hovens in the closed position. Uh, there's That's evidence very, very What pretty. about the fossils that are not in sedimentary rock? So what I'm asking is, because you, you talk about the global flood, fine. Let, let, let's say you believe that, fine. What about fossils that are not found in sedimentary rock? Found in volcano, volcanic ash layers, found in sandstone, where it's basically dry sand environment. There's no water there at all. Do you accept those right. fossils? Like, wh what do you think about them? Are they caused by the global flood? Flood? What happened there? Well, that's why I said at the beginning, uh, you'd have to define what you mean by fossil. If it's a preserved remains of an animal, they can be preserved in dry volcanic ash. They can be preserved in a sand dune. It's sure. rock, Ken. It's rock. The fossils are mineralized bone that's now become rock. Whether it's okay, in a sand environment, in a sedimentary yeah. rock or a volcano, they're not alive. There's no mummified skin in it whatsoever. They're rock. Are you saying that an animal can be buried in a sand dune and turn to rock? Sandstone, yes. Yeah, quicksand, bogs, um, mudslides, hovind. It can. All can form fossils. Does it have to have water to change the minerals into a fluid that'll go inside each cell? And most and most, most fossils are found in sedimentary environments because that is the most that is the most um, what's the word efficient way I guess of creating effective Very way good. of creating fossils. You don't need water for impression fossils. Yes, but that's not saying every single fossil is. What I'm hearing from you, Ken, is you believe every single fossil is found in that particular environment, and then you concluded it must have been a global flood. I'm pointing out there are many fossils that are not found in aqueous environment at all, not even in sedimentary rock. How do you explain that? Fossils that are found in dry sand, fossils that are found where volcano ash is falling down. Was there a volcano that's blowing up underwater? Like, how does that kind of work? And don't forget, we're talking about sedimentary, volcano ash, sedimentary on top again. And I've heard you kind of explain this by saying there was a flood was receded a volcano blow up then there was a flood again i've heard you kind of make some really let's let's be honest pretty stupid explanation so i just want to kind of make, hear <laughs> it from you right now are there fossils that are be, that are formed that are not sedimentary and if so how well i think evolution is very stupid also since you want to slip to ad hominem but listen I, I've never, I said, I think nearly all fossils were formed in sedimentary rock. I couldn't prove all of them were. You can, yeah, as I said, things can mummify. That's why I said at the beginning, define the word fossil. Sure, some animals could die and be preserved in volcanic ash. They could maybe be preserved in a sand dune. We buried our pig in a sand dune a couple years ago. Let's dig it up, guys. See if it, see if it fossilized, okay? What we observe is animals die. So most are not preserved at all. The fact I simply said at the beginning, before you went way off track, like you always do, is there any evidence of any of these animals that we're finding, that, 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 is there any evidence of any animal today producing babies that anybody would consider a different kind? Okay, that was just a complete fucking dodge by Kent. So, um, gone about an hour and 15 minutes. I want to say congratulations to Ian on, on his debate victory. I think I, 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 the whole video is like two hours. So, you know, I would like to cover as much as I could, but you know, I have my limits as well. I know there are some good jabs that Ian gets in here as well. 
Um, if you guys can comment the timestamps for those um, in the comment section of this video, or uh, yeah, I can go. I'll, I'll link. I'll link them in the comment section. I'll look up the timestamps. But um, congratulations to Ian. Thank you guys for for hanging out in the side chat with me and watching. Um, it's really good debate. Uh, I think Ian did a great job. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for watching. Peace out.